What's up, friends and followers? Michael McFarland here. I'm sitting in my garage in McFarland's corner, and it's been a while since I've given you a lesson. Um, today's lesson is going to be very unique. Um, it's what I'm going to call McFarland's Perspective. I'm going to deliver a lesson today, probably in a way that no one ever has before. Um, the topic, in essence, is the three locations that bass are caught. When I say three locations, man, that makes it sound real simple. And it's not. It's not as simple as just three locations. I'm going to break this down and I'm going to give an incredible perspective as a life from a lifetime of fishing that's very relative to even hunting or anyone who targets pursuing pursuit of a predator. Okay? And bass is a predator. A largemouth bass is most definitely a predator. Okay? Um, so please, this is going to be a little difficult. Uh, I, I, this, if you will stay in this video until the very end, don't get bored. I might even get you confused a little bit. That's just, I'm sorry. That's my nature. But if you'll stay in there all the way to the end, I think you'll be blown away at how I weave this together. And when I summarize the lesson, it will change you as a fisherman forever okay this right here is McFarland's perspective of how I go about in essence a breakdown of the water and how the fish use it okay here we go first off too by the way welcome thank you so much um, that's kind of my intro to this um, this is going to be very difficult, so please bear with me. Um, but the three locations that bass are caught, the three places that bass are caught, are in the bedroom, the kitchen, and or the transitioning stopping spots. Now you might be going, huh? I didn't expect to hear that. The bedroom, the kitchens, and the transitional stopping spots. Okay. So first off, what do I mean? What do I mean by bedroom? Okay. Well, a bedroom is anywhere that the bass finds the most comfort. He's not stirred up in that spot. He's not fired up. It's a relaxing spot. It has the right temperature. It has the usually some kind of cover for him to hide in, him or her. Um, it's a safety place, a place of security. When a cold front hits, they want to go somewhere safe. Um, so it's not just one specific spot. And it may vary where throughout the year, okay? Depending on where the fish, in what pattern the fish is in. The fish is in a summer pattern, fall pattern, winter pattern, spring pattern. Those are different locations that the fish may be existing. And at that time, it's going to use different things that are available. So very much like a fish tank at your house. If you have an empty fish tank, the fish are scattered all over the tank and they don't know what to do. In lieu of pet store fish, they're not quite the same as wild bass, but studies have shown that when you put a bass in that fish tank, if it has nothing to uh, relate to, it suspends and doesn't know where to be. The minute you put anything in that fish tank and the fish relates to it and or hides in it, okay? So the first thing is bedrooms, an example of bedrooms would be like deep offshore trees, um, maybe ledges where the fish can stack up and suspend in a comfort zone at 30 feet or 18 feet, whatever the desired time of year and temperature requires. Brush piles, tree stumps, grass lines, tree lines, roads, docks, all of these things can be bedrooms. Those are places where the bass can actually live, but there's not necessarily food there. Okay. In some cases, there is both. In many cases, in a really good 
healthy lake. There's both. Okay. Grass, for example, grass provides both. Grass provides a home to live in. It provides oxygen. It provides plankton. All kinds of little critters live in it. Brim live in it. They all feed in it. Crawfish live in it. So the bass can actually live in and amongst grass, maybe in the grass, maybe in the pockets, maybe underneath the mats, maybe on the edges, but they live right there in the kitchen. Now, I'm jumping forward to kitchen. We're going to get that in a minute. But that kitchen's where the food is, okay? So grass is ideal. And in history, any lake that we have had that's loaded with grass is always loaded with bass. I'm not going to take you on this topic, but facts are also the same that any lake in every lake that we have removed the grass, we have lost the bass. These are facts, okay? Deadline facts. Grass grows bass. It's the most healthy situation for them because it's both the bedroom and the kitchen all in one. But staying with bedrooms. So brush piles are, are, are a place where bass can go out offshore and live. Trees in Lake Fork are more often used as a bedroom. There are so many submerged trees offshore that the fish can go out offshore and live in the trees. And they're going to actually have that nice comfort zone, quiet. They're left alone from most fishermen and predators during the day. And where do they feed, though? Well, they feed on the nearby local windblown points, for example, from day to day. And we're going to get to that in a second. So bedrooms, that's what a bedroom is. It's a place that the bass goes, maybe even a bridge pile on. It goes during the off times, during storms, during times when it's not hungry or non-active. And it, that's its comfort place, okay? Bedrooms. Before I move on, I want to make sure that I clarify the difference between structure and cover, okay? Because sometimes the bass will suspend and that's the bedroom. But they're suspending over structure. In lakes that do not offer a lot of cover, no wood, no lay down logs or trees, no junk or debris, no brush piles to get in, no matted grass or anything to get in. That's what cover is. Structure, think of like your house. The frame of your house is structure. So a big hump offshore is a structure. The wooden trees around it is cover. Okay, so the difference between structure and cover is, is cover is grass, cover is trees. A big oak tree standing tall is cover. If that big oak tree fell over a creek and now ends up being like a bridge and the berm, the whole stalk of the base of the tree is like a, like a bridge, it might become a structure and become cover. So please stay with me. Remember I said we're going to go, we're going to weave and wind here. It's going to be a long lesson. And at the end, you're just going to go, wow, okay? So I wanted to clarify the difference between structure and cover because that bedroom can often be just an offshore road, deep road bed, that the bass suspend on the edges of that road where that road breaks into the deep water or ledges or breaks or humps. They suspend above the humps, okay? That's a bedroom. And they can be really hard to catch in the bedroom because there's usually not food there and they're not used to eating there. It still is a predator. It still has a trigger effect and can be caught in the bedroom. We'll come around to that in a minute, okay? The kitchen. I hope I conveyed my point there. Fish tank, empty fish tank has no bedroom. Put a little sunken ship and your fish goes and finds a bedroom, okay? Safety place, secure, good temperatures, good comfort. In the wild, that changes throughout the year. Kitchens. The kitchen is where they find food obviously okay again we talked about grass grass already has it all in one boom a refrigerator shoot grass isn't just a refrigerator i mean a, a a kitchen and a bedroom it's an infirmary it's got great oxygen it filters the water i cannot believe once again we're removing the grass throughout the united states of america and our lakes um for no reason either there's really no good reason it's it's political but let's stay focused um they don't want to start fires the kitchen the kitchen is places like flats, shallow feeding flats, windblown points and pockets, shell bents, ridge lines, current areas, eddies, pockets, anywhere that the bait fish can be found. So generally the wind is your friend because wherever that wind blows is where that bait fish gets blown and gets pocketed or becomes vulnerable. 
windblown main leg points. How many times do you hear tournaments won on windblown main leg points? Why? Because the fish were bedroomed offshore in the trees and they went to those windblown points to feed. Bedroom, kitchen. Bedroom, kitchen. They live in the trees. They go to a shell bed on Lake Fork to feed. Bedroom, kitchen. Often they're going to live very near that food. Now remember, it's not always about shad. All right, there's other species that of, of small fish and things, crawfish, yellow bass, brim. Bass love brim. So how about a scenario of when the brim are spawning, the bass may choose to go live out in the trees and spend their time in the trees of the creek nearby during the brim spawn so they can go raid the brim. So they're right there, they're close, they're not far from the brim. You're probably going to catch them while they're raiding the brim the best. But you know where they are in the trees to fish when they're not. Okay, so again, kitchens are flats, windblown points and pockets, anywhere that bait or food can be found. In quite a few cases, you'll have residential fish, docks, for example. Docks offer cover and structure, okay, and often ambushing angles from a dock. A fish can live on a dock and it's almost as good as, you know, grass. It doesn't offer oxygen and it doesn't have it's quite as good, but there will be uh, algae that grows on the wood and plankton and things. So it's a health zone. It's a healthy zone. Docks can become, you know, a little bit of both. Um, so often you'll see that, you know, that same area. But more often than not, with us removing the grasses in our lakes, the evolution is becoming bedrooms and kitchens. I've seen this in tons of lakes on the West Coast. Uh, Lake Havasu, for example, it's a river system. It's got rock piles, and that's about it. Sandy, and, and there's some structures that stick out, or escarpments of boulders and rocks and things. Um, most of them don't offer a lot of cover because you can't get inside those type of rocks. Um, so Havasu has sunk in these plastic structures. They're more to hold the bait and the small fish. The bass suspend above and around that, and, and the food is that. So the, the bedroom is the suspension around it, the kitchen is that little box that holds all the bait and feed. And so, you know, a lot of times, back to my point here, it's becoming a new evolution. We're recognizing that the fish live somewhere else than it feeds. Now, we've known this for some time, but I'm trying to tell you that it's happening a lot. And biologists, ecologists would say that a bass will travel up to one mile to go find food depending on the lake and the amount of food that's in the lake. Um, in Fork, they don't have to travel that far. There's so much food that they just find the nearest comfort zone to the food of choice. So if they're on the yellow bass, you go find the yellow bass and somewhere close are the big bass. If it's a time of year they're on the brim, as we just talked about, the brim spawn, the bass aren't far. If it's early spring and the shad spawns on, you go find the shad spawn, you found the bass. So you found the kitchen. You got me? That's the kitchen. Anywhere that bait or food can be obtained that's different than where the bass chooses to live. All right? It's becoming more and more frequent that the bass is doing this. Um, this is how McFarland fishing, this is how we fish. This is the theory that I use. Um, and it's the evolution of our new lakes without the grass, okay? Um, so the final is the, the transitional spots. Um, before I go into that, so I talked about bedrooms, I clarified bedrooms, and I believe I've clarified the kitchens. And again, I've talked about that uh, on one day, the wind blows out of the south, so the, tr the, the fish leave the trees and go to according banks across the lake. The next day it blows from the north banks and they leave the trees and go to different points. That's why you practice on Friday and you catch them real good on one point. And the next morning, Saturday, that's not being windblown anymore. And the fish are not there anymore. They didn't live on that point. They were feeding there. All right. So they went back to the bedroom. And the next day when it was feed time, they went somewhere else. And that's no big deal for a fish to swim. I mean, think about it. Five, ten miles an hour. How long does it take them to swim somewhere? Okay. When they make moves, and not these feeding moves, not from bedroom to kitchen, and kitchen to bedroom, but from seasonal pattern. For example, it's hot, they're offshore in summer, and it cools down. 
And it's the bait that was also offshore now goes up the creeks. The fish have to follow it. The bait will never, ever, ever go to the fish. That's crazy. The fish follow the bait. So in essence, learn about bait throughout the year, what the, what the bass choose, what type of bait throughout the seasons, why the bait's vulnerable, et cetera, et cetera. Matching the hatch, um, size, color, all that's important about it. But the bass follow it. So now maybe as fall transition happens, the bass have to move from the offshore places that were bedrooms to new bedrooms, which would maybe be in fall the mouths of the creeks where the bait begins to pile up. This is called transition. They're making a change. They're moving. Most likely it's from one depth to another. So there's potentially acclimation in this fish. It takes time to get there. When transition happens, like we are going through right now, the fall transition, it's the toughest time to catch a fish. Not just fall, any time that there's a transition happening. Transitioning fish are the most difficult. They're moving from one place to the next changing the lifestyle, changing the area, changing the depth, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So when they're transitioning, you need to use stopping spots, okay? It's the only place they can be caught, stopping spots, which are very simple. They're used ditches, drains, creeks to migrate from offshore in. They follow tree lines, they follow roads, for example, when they're migrating in the creek and they come to bridge pylons, that's a stop spot. When they're migrating in the creek and there's a 100-yard straight stretch and then it makes a big, huge swing. It makes a big creek swing because there's a main lake point or a point of some kind, secondary point, whatever. There's a point coming down. That creek's made a swing. That's a stop spot. A lot of stop spots can be real simple once they actually get up in there and they're in the backwater and now they're shallow and they're still in the drain, but they start to pull up on the secondary point and they stop. Maybe there's a nice stump that's there that they stop. Stopping spots when the fish is transitioning is the place to catch them. Otherwise, it's very difficult. Okay, very difficult. Worst fish to try and catch and target transitioning fish because they're moving. All right. Um, I think I gave you some good examples. Um, I'm going to give you another. I'm going to use Lake Fork. For example, when the fish decide to go up Running Creek, they leave the summer water and they migrate up the creek. The first thing they come to is a bridge. It's a funnel point. The lake is probably 300, 400 yards wide. They're in the creek. They're migrating. They're maybe dispersing in and out of the creek going for food um, on secondaries and banks and shoreline and wind accordingly. But when they get to that crunch, the bridge crunch, it's a stop spot. All the bridges this time of year or in spring when the fish are migrating in and out are stop spots. I'm not telling you to just go fish bridges. Use that basic concept. Ask yourself, when a fish is migrating here, where are the things that he'd stop on, that he would pull up on? Okay, learn that and in the spring, you'll catch yourself a lot more of those big pre-staging females because they really pull up on things, okay? Transitioning, transitioning spots. If in fact, we now understand about bedrooms and we also understand about kitchens, we realize that these fish on Lake Fork are living out here in this big oak tree, majority of the time, 80% of the day or whatever, and they're feeding locally here on shell beds. Okay, let's say that's the analogy. Now, here's going to be the really, really hard part for me, I think. As a tournament angler, Kevin Van Dam probably does this the best. But Kevin Van Dam follows the majors and the minors. His tournament application is an eight hour day. Now, of course, MLF has changed quite a bit, but let's just take the typical tournament that we get eight hours to fish in, okay? Even a guide trip, a typical day, we've got an eight hour window we're gonna fish in. Any major and minder that falls during that time that we're fishing is most likely, not always, but most likely the time that the bass will go to the kitchen. How many of you heard the story, cattle stand up and the fish should be biting? 
this applies to the theory that I'm teaching you. Yes, that does happen. Kitchens and bedrooms, it happens all the time. Folks, this is the game that McFarland Fishing plays, and this is how I play it. So in other words, the shell beds that I fish on Lake Fork are very much timing. They're deer feeders. They hold the food a lot of the year, different depths. But they hold the food, they hold the plankton, and they hold the shad like a deer feeder. When do my fish leave the bedroom and come feed on those shell beds? Most of the time during the majors and the minors, okay? Throughout the day or the year, water temperatures determine how many times they'll visit. The hotter the water, the more often they'll visit. Colder water, they may not visit it near as frequent because their digestive system is slower. But what I'm summing up now is number one, as a guide or as a pro, or even if I was back in tournaments, it allows me to understand once I've done some homework, and I've found the bedroom and I've found some local kitchens to those fish. Okay, now we got an area that I'm fishing and I got a school of fish that I'm choosing to work on. I know how to apply. So I, let's just say, scenario now, tomorrow from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. is a major moon phase and suggestively a best fishing of the day window. More than likely from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m., I'm going to fish for those fish near a shallow shell bed that's windblown. Tomorrow, I'm going to pick a shallow shell bed. From 6 a.m. to 8 a.m., I'm going to try and find some fish in some trees that are near that windblown shell bed. And we're going to grind on those fish in the bedroom. Okay? We may get a bite or two. That's a bonus. If you're in a tournament, it's a huge bonus. That could finish the limit. All right? From 8 to 10, all of a sudden, I make a small move predicting that the fish have left, or sometimes if you're really on this pattern that I'm teaching you now, you see it leave. You saw the fish in the trees and for two hours you were trying to make them bite. You couldn't make them bite. You got one bite and all of a sudden they're gone. Where did they go? <gasps> they went to the shell bed and now you pull up on the shell bed and you have your smack down. Watch Kevin Van Dam's history and how he used to fish, how much he would watch his watch before he would turn and pour it on. He knew when to throw the rattle trap. He knew when to wind it as fast as he could. And he knew when to go slow down and grind. So the grind is the bedroom. The catching in the best times are when they're feeding in the kitchens. Folks, whether you're a tournament angler or a guide or just a fun fisherman, I believe I've conveyed my best perspective of the three locations, in other words, in essence, an area now that's to be broken down, intimately understood that you have a main lake point with a creek swing next to it, two shell beds, some lay down trees, a couple of rows of cedars, an offshore hump, the main lake swings by and some trees that those fish live in and you intimately understand the underwater structure, which today can be done by studying with your sonars. And you learn where the bedrooms are and you learn where the kitchens are and you apply your time now most effectively through the day. Now, it's not as easy as that just sounds, but those that execute that the best find the most success. I'm going to end you with one more analogy. One of the things that makes me fall in fishing so successful, anyone that's been with me um, can testify to this. Many times I will find a spot and I've made my prediction that for the day, I've re assessed the day, the wind is doing this, this shell bed will be active, we are going to stay here. Just like sitting in a tree stand and waiting for the deer. And when the bass show up, my clients are happy. Sometimes we have to sit a long time. Sometimes maybe I'll, if I'm really tight on the bite and I know that when it's going to happen, I'll, I can do other things like I discussed, go grind in the bedroom. Sometimes if I don't know where the bedroom is, I just go put myself right where the kitchen is and I wait and I keep fishing. That right there should have just pulled this full circle for you. That's McFarland's perspective. How to break down a lake. Break not the lake down, 
and how the fish act in three basic locations or patterns, if you will, three places that you'll be able to locate the bass, a bedroom, a kitchen, and or transitioning. That's it. All right. So if you have any questions, um, please put them below. Um, thumbs up if you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe. Um, I'm, I really could use that. Share with some friends. Tell your friends. I'm really trying to get my numbers up on the subscriptions. Um, that really helps. Um, so please, I appreciate that. As much as I'm spilling my guts here, um, and I promise you this right here, I had to search inside myself and, and, and to, I wanted you guys to understand what it is I do. This here, the way that I understand it, if I taught it the way I understand it, this is what makes me more successful more often than not, understanding this, scientifically attacking this away. Um, and I believe it will you too. All in all, I appreciate you very much. Um, also, find me on Facebook. Um, you can find me, The Lake Fork Adventures Guide Service. Go there and please give that a like. My Instagram, The Lake Fork Guide. Um, appreciate you all watching so much. I hope that this did hit you as well as I wanted it to. So, I'm Mike McFarland, The Lake Fork Guide, giving you a lesson for right here in October in Northeast Texas from my corner and the Goat Lake, Lake Fork. Thanks for watching.